So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Abu, a book of one's own book club. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Lucy Makara, and I'm absolutely delighted to have Marianne Seacart, author of The Authority Gap, as our guest author tonight. Uh, so Marianne says she leads a portfolio life, but that really underplays by an awful long way her extraordinary talents, versatility and energy. So Marianne makes programmes for BBC Radio 4. She's a visiting professor at King's College London. She spent 2018 to 19 as visiting fellow of All Souls College Oxford, and that's where she did the extensive research that makes the authority gap such an influential and indeed authoritative book. But Marianne is far from an academic in an ivory tower. She's been on the front line of journalism and politics for with 20 years under her belt as assistant editor and columnist at The Times. She's been a columnist at The Independent, where she has a huge following for her writing on politics, economics, feminism, parenthood and life in general. Added to which Marianne has appeared multiple times on pretty much every political TV and radio show there is. A small selection of her other work includes being chair of the Social Market Foundation think tank. She's been on the content board of Ofcom, the Council of Tate Modern and the No campaign. She's been on the board of Women in Journalism and the National Council for One Parent Families. And really excitingly, she's the chair of the judges for the Women's Prize for Fiction this year. So welcome, Marianne. And Thank I'm, you, Lucy. You can imagine how I spent Christmas and New Year up to here in novels. <laughs> yes, it's <must laughs> been wonderful. <Still> am. <laughs> no, it's really exciting. So um, the first thing I wanted to ask you is where did it start? Where did the idea for the authority gap for the book first come into your head and why? Was there a specific incident or was it an agglomeration of experiences? What was it that triggered the concept and made you feel you had to write the book? Gosh, the trouble is it's really a lifetime of experiences. I mean, I can remember what annoyed me most as a child, even a small child, was being patronised, being underestimated, not being listened to, my brother being allowed to do things I wasn't allowed to do. You know, so really from the age of about five or six, I probably was aware of this notion of the authority gap, though, of course, I didn't have the words to describe it. Um, and though I think I've been pretty lucky through most of my career because I have had public authority conferred on me by newspapers, uh, which really helps, I think, if you're a woman, I have seen the way I've been treated if people didn't know what I did. And I've certainly seen other women being treated badly, um, really because of their gender, just not being accorded the same sort of respect as men. And I've seen the assumption that a man knows what he's talking about until he proves otherwise, whereas for a woman, it's all too often the other way around. And that's really what I'm writing about, the sense that we just take men more seriously than we do women. And women have to do more to prove their competence, their expertise, their authority. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because a lot of us are here are authors or writing their books, I'd love to know about your writing process. So are you a planner? Do you structure before writing? Did you interview your subjects and then draw out the themes? Or did you decide what you were going to write about and then interview to get the to get the content? How did it how did it work and how long did it take you to to do all the to put it all together and write the book? I think it was about three and a half years from coming up with the idea to the book coming out. Uh, and as you said, I spent a year at All Souls really with my head down, trying to amass all the academic evidence, all the proper research evidence for the phenomenon that I was writing about, because I wanted it to be absolutely watertight. I didn't want any men to review the book and say, oh, well, you know, she doesn't she hasn't got her facts right. Or this is just supposition or this is just polemic or it's just anecdotal. You know, I thought. I really owe it to womankind to make sure that there is an enormous amount of ammo in this book. And the idea of interviewing, because I interviewed about 40 incredibly authoritative, very successful women right at the top of their game. So former presidents and prime ministers, uh, CEOs, bishops, soldiers, <laughs> film directors, orchestral conductors, you name it, um, as well as women who weren't you know, that senior. But 
I did that, A, because I thought their stories would be really interesting, but B, because I thought if even they have suffered the sort of behavior that the authority gap brings, then that is pretty good proof that all womankind does. If even the most authoritative women do, that's that's one way of proving that the authority gap exists. And, you know, guess what? About 99% of them had. Um, and then how did I structure it? Well, I've always been a journalist, so I've never written anything longer than about two or 3,000 words, at least in, until now. And I was actually quite worried. How would I write something the length of a book? And because I'm such a sort of... Um, deadline monkey, you know, I can only ever get things done at the very last minute. Uh, it was going to be no use saying to myself, well, I've got to have written 100,000 words in a year's time, because I wouldn't start writing until week before. <laughs> that was my worry, at least. Um, so I thought I've just got to divvy it up into smaller and smaller and smaller chunks um, until each chunk is manageable, and I can treat it a bit like a journalistic assignment. So I did pretty much all the research before I started writing. But then I, um, I decided I needed to do about 5,000 words for each chapter. And I thought, well, 5,000 is just about manageable in a chunk. And I probably got to do, well, nearly a chapter a week. I set myself the task of doing 1,000 words a day when I was actually writing. And there were some days when I knew I couldn't do that because I was you know, amassing all the research that I'd already done for the next chapter, say, and then I had to work out what order I was going to use it in. But, um, but when I was actually properly writing, I had to do a thousand words before I was allowed to get up from my desk. Sorry, does that, there were quite a lot of questions in there. I'm yeah, sure no, sorry. Really <laughs> yes, no, no, that does absolutely answer them. Um, so I, I'm just looking in the comments and Satna's saying, I've been listening and nodding all the way through the book so far. She's listening to the audio book <laughs> as I did. Um, and Faye says, so uh, relate to this, especially today, having been totally screwed over by men at work over salary and after recent promotion. Um, oh. So, <laughs> yeah, depressing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, I was interested particularly in um, your second chapter, which is in a way your first chapter in the book, because the, fir the first chapter is for people who might need to be convinced that there was an authority, there is an authority gap. And so I think probably most of us could have discounted that in, apart from the fact that it's beautifully written. Um, but your, 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 your sort of starting point um, is um, of the view from the other side, what we mm. can learn about men and women from people who've lived as both. Um, and you clearly feel this is important proof of the authority gap in the face of denial. So tell us, uh, tell us some of the, the sort of the people you talk to um, who have been both men and women and how they found it. Well, I found this the most fascinating chapter to research and write, actually, because in normal life, suppose you and a male colleague are both up for promotion. You're at the same level. He gets the promotion and you don't. You may well suspect that bias is at play, but it's terribly hard each time to prove because after all, your manager might say, well, he was just better than you. And how can you gain say that? So the experience of trans people allows us to control for every other variable and isolate the one that matters, which is gender, because they're exactly the same person with the same ability and intelligence and personality and expertise and experience and the only thing that's changed is their gender, then if people treat them quite differently when they see them as female rather than male or the other way around, that is proof that it's gender that makes all the difference, not their ability. And so I tell a story to start with of two Stanford professors who each transitioned in middle age in the opposite direction at the same time. And so they became friends and they used to compare notes. And Ben Barry is a neuroscientist once he started living as a man, he said, I've had the thought a million times, I'm just taken more seriously now. My work's taken more seriously. The same damned work, as he put it, is taken more seriously now that I'm a man or seen as a man. He said, I can even finish a sentence without being interrupted by a man. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And someone was overheard at the back of one of his seminars who didn't know his history, didn't know that he was a trans man. Uh, was overheard saying, oh, Ben Barris gave a great seminar today, but then his work's so much better than his sister's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, unbelievable. Himself, right? Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and meanwhile, Joan Rothgarden, who's an evolutionary biologist, transitioned in the opposite direction. 
And when she'd been living as a man, she said, life was just so easy. She said, I just felt like I was on this conveyor belt to success. And she said, I talked and people were quiet and they listened. My work was taken seriously. I was treated with respect. Once she started living as a woman, all that fell away. And she said, you know, I was patronized, I was interrupted, I was talked over, I was attacked personally in a way that people never dared do when they saw me as a man. They would tell me things like, you haven't read the literature, or you don't understand the statistics. She said, that never happened to me before. And she said, start with, I thought, well, if I'm gonna live as a woman, I'm darn well gonna be discriminated against like a, a woman. And then she said, well, the thrill of that has worn off, I can tell you. <laughs> and her conclusion was, Men are assumed to be competent until proven otherwise, whereas women are assumed to be incompetent until they prove otherwise. Now, both these experiences may sound anecdotal, but actually sociologists have done much bigger studies of the experiences of trans men and trans women and have found exactly the same phenomenon. That trans men, women who transition to become men, find themselves so much more respected, so much more listened to, they can get away with more, they get promoted faster, they're treated with more respect. And men who transition to being women find exactly the opposite. So I just think that's absolute slam dunk proof of the existence of the authority gap for any yeah. man who might want to um, deny it. Yeah, because it, it is so easy for, um, you know, for people to say, especially men to say, well, it's nothing to do with gender. It's nothing to do with that. Mm. You're just not as good as or, you know, you're being paranoid or whatever. And um, and it, it really, uh, yeah, it's very hard to prove it when you're put on the spot like that without then sounding all those all those adjectives that get thrown at women like shrill or demanding or, you know, mm. whatever. Um, so, Difficult, yes, prickly, paranoid. Yeah oversensitive yeah. chippy exactly. my first agent um who failed to sell this book to any publisher told me it was too moany too chippy and too strident oh uh, strident that's the one yes strident. Strident. read yes, it i course. sacked him i replaced him <laughs> and then it went to a seven way auction <laughs> Yeah, that's brilliant. Yes. Well, I hope he's really kicking himself now. Yeah, he is. He's furious. Oh, uh, so um, uh, somebody's saying in the chat, this book is our zeitgeist. I would welcome any info that anyone knows of digital tools currently used in the boardroom workplace to measure speech analytics. I'm in the mm. process of getting a startup going for um, at Coach for Schools. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, I'm using yeah, in a... many boardrooms, Marianne. So what's what, what's what are your tips for? for um conquering well, in terms of tech I, I i know there's um there is an app called woman interrupted which detects when a woman is interrupted and wow. that is very useful because women get interrupted much more than men do almost universally by men if women are interrupted by women it tends to be sort of affirmative interruption of a woman sort of saying oh yes you're so right i agree in other words reinforcing you and allowing you to carry on whereas men's interruptions are much more likely to be negative ones intended to shut you down and actually even the most authoritative women suffer from this so there was a fascinating academic study done of the u.s supreme court and you don't get much more authoritative than that and although women make up only a third of the justices they are um they make up to, sorry they suffer two-thirds of all interruptions so in other words, they're four times more likely to be interrupted than their male colleagues, 96% of the time by other men. That's um, incredible. So I, I think yes. there's another app you can use uh, in meetings, which simply detects when a female voice is speaking and when a male voice is speaking, and then sees whether men are taking up disproportionate conversational time compared with women. And I would imagine that 95% of the time they will because I mean, it's one of the strongest findings in linguistics is that men just talk longer than women yeah, in public, absolutely. more than women in public settings. And that's because women are, women know instinctively that if they talk too much, people will recoil, they will disapprove. And what's even, and they're right about that. Academic research has also shown this, that we don't, you know, we rate women more lowly, their competence ratings fall if they're thought to be talking too much, whereas men's competence ratings rise. But another problem is that if a man and a woman are talking for exactly the same amount of time, we perceive the woman to have dominated the conversation. Yeah. So talking too much may actually just mean talking a fair amount. Yeah, 
not even necessarily as much as a man yeah yeah no it's it's very hard to get past those ones um mm. difficult to do um bev says i know of a married couple who are both scientists working in the same field of research her career ranked when she took his surname as everyone presumed the, her papers were his so no her career tanked so he was receiving yeah. credit for her work wonderful god <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes i bet she never received credit for his work even no though was just no the name, absolutely right? yes <laughs> Lisa says, I was today the only female in a meeting talking construction. It was assumed I was a PA. Nothing wrong with that. I was told not asked to take notes and distribute at the end. I was actually the project lead and said, I'm going to, I'm just going to record this meeting. You can take your own notes as I'm now perceived as difficult. Apparently this project is going to be fun. God. Oh. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too depressing it is um, and the trouble uh, is the more the more male stereotype the field you're in like construction the worse this is unfortunately yeah yes absolutely um and, and also um i'd like to bring in Anne, um dr Anne whitehouse hello Anne. do you want to unmute hello. yourself so Anne was in um in in science um academic science um so Anne, you were going to have a, you had a question oh and Anne's also the author of a fantastic book called pull back your power um ah. about uh, <laughs> the similar subject so yes Anne, you wanted to uh yes yeah, so firstly i can say you'll your book beautifully um, validates everything that my research has also shown, which is very much focused on the, the subconscious patterning underneath all of this stuff. You know, there, there wasn't anything <laughs> that you'd, your research showed that wasn't totally aligned with mine, which is beautiful, beautiful great. validation. So <laughs> that's always great. But uh, what I wanted to, to uh, mention is the this thing about the, the male default, because we have this, this thing where, as you know, so much in society, in, in um, our, um, you know, the companies and institutions, the way of doing things is actually male default, male benchmark, male definition, far more than just it's a man, very much uh, like a deep programming of, in, in that way. But, you know, the world and assumes though that this is neutral, that the world is the world, but women have to fit into that benchmark, which causes all kinds of problems for, for us. Mm -hmm. And but when I've presented all of this stuff in, in, my, in my way, what I've been told many times by people is, oh, surely we've moved past gender, that the world is, is neutral. Mm -hmm. And of course it's not, it's no <laughs> male default. So, I mean, obviously if somebody reads you know, all the research, reads all of this, you cannot help but see, well, of course it is, but, what I was wondering is, is if you had someone there who is saying, no, you know, we've moved beyond gender, one size fits all, it's, you know, women should be able to function perfectly in the status quo. How would you, there, you know, say to that person, well, actually, this is how the male default is there, this is how it is undermining women every single day? You know, it's, it's, I mean, I know how, how I address this, but I wondered if you had a way of putting that person on the spot and opening their eyes to know it's a male default world and we are battling upstream every single day. I mean, well, I sometimes use the analogy that it's as if men are swimming in a river with a strong current and they don't feel the current, but they see the banks racing past them and they think, God, I'm a strong swimmer. And then they see women swimming in the opposite direction, struggling to make headway against the current. And they say, well, it's their fault. They're just not as good at swimming as I am. And, and so I try and explain that, that this is why you think, if you're talking to a man, this is why you might think, oh, it's all over. And you know, gender isn't an issue anymore because you're not feeling these slights to your self-esteem and you know, this current that you're having to fight, you're really having to struggle to make headway against. And we are feeling it. Um, and I say it's as, it's as wrongheaded as telling a person of color that racism doesn't exist mm -hmm. if you're white. Um, but then, you know, there are all sorts of statistics I can quote that, for instance, 70% of men will evaluate a man more highly than a woman for achieving exactly the same goals. And that rises to 75% for more senior men. You know, they're also, and I will always say it's an academic study, you know, the academic research shows. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, so they don't think it's anecdotal. But, you know, there, I, there are sort of five or six studies like that at my fingertips that I, that I will use. And, and does that work? <laughs> does it convince people? 
Um, so hard to tell, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, for a start, their pride is such that they're quite often quite reluctant to admit it at the time. But maybe they think about it. Maybe yeah. that, you know, ideally they read the book. Not that I want to sell lots of copies of it, but I just want to spread the word. Um, take it out of the library, borrow it from a friend. But <laughs> yeah, of course. So, just quickly, the sort of thing I, I would say is like, look at our, our parliament system, how that is antagonistic, you know, attacking and that's normal, right? And then you say, well, what if women had developed our political system? Would it be the same? Mm. And you say, and they say, no, of course it wouldn't. And they, ah, that's <laughs> the real default in action. That's so, very yeah. good. That's very good. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Talking about um, politics, you interviewed um, Marianne, you interviewed Julia Gillard, um, who mm. was the Australian um, Prime Minister. And I was thinking about, I mean, Julia Gillard in Australia and Theresa May in the UK, they just couldn't win as leaders of their countries and not necessarily because they were um, certainly in Julia's case, all bad. And yet, uh, I mean, you think of Angela Merkel in Germany and Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, they seem to have somehow got it right. What do you think? What do you think of the qualities? What did they do right? And what did Julia and uh, Julia Gillard and Theresa May do wrong? Can you put your finger on it at all? Uh, well, I would say that Australia wasn't ready for a female prime minister yeah. at yeah. the time, because it was some time ago. Yes. And, and, and it is quite a sexist country. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and I, th I think any woman would have struggled. I think Julia Gillard's very good. And I think any woman would have struggled at that time. Uh, Theresa May, I knew quite well, and frankly, isn't so great. <laughs> you know, she, I mean, she was up against an, an almost impossible situation um, with Brexit and a divided party, but then she did actually choose to hold an election and lose seats, um, which was pretty poor political yeah. tactics. And I used to deal with her a lot and she, unlike most women, she was actually very atypical in the sense that she had very low emotional intelligence. She was almost cripplingly shy and very, found it terribly, terribly hard to deal with people. So she was absolutely in the wrong job. You know, she, yeah. she was no good at schmoozing her party or her cabinet or other European leaders uh, or voters. You know, she just didn't, she wasn't good at making emotional connections. Um, which is unusual for a woman, but hey, you know, that's what she was like. So I, I don't actually think she was cut out to be prime minister. Merkel and Ardern are both very talented in very different ways. I think, I think in Germany, they loved her absolute calm, rational, almost sort of plodding approach. I think she was, she was just very, very steady. And, uh, and that seemed to appeal to Germany at the time. And Jacinda Ardern is, is different. She's actually much more emotionally open, which I think New Zealanders love, um, and see very high emotional intelligence, in fact, I would say, sort of seems to know exactly how to respond to any crisis. Um, yeah. and she, they're she, just more talented she, politicians. Yes, I mean, she is very talented, but she sort of has the, um, it's interesting that, I mean, you can sort of see the authority in women grow as they get older and, and Angela Merkel had that advantage, I think, of being older. Jacinda Ardern is young, attractive, um, mm. a comparatively recent mother, all the things that tend to undermine women. So she's doing, you know, incredibly well, I think. Yeah, I agree, actually, it's a good point. But I think, in a sense, the most interesting question is why was, didn't Hillary Clinton become president? Yeah. And what's, because what's she your was answer? actually... Yeah, I mean, you know, she was fantastically well qualified, probably the best qualified presidential candidate ever yes. in terms of all the political experience that she had. They couldn't bear the idea of having a woman leader. Some sorry, some men couldn't bear the idea of having a female president because as many women voted for Hillary as voted for Obama, but many fewer men did and they switched to Trump. So I think that was actually naked sexism. And in fact, the biggest predictor of voting for Trump after being Republican was agreeing with what are called hostile sexist statements like women will sleep with anyone to get to the top and things like that. That was the biggest predictor of voting for Trump. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question in the um, in the comments here. Are there gradations in the status incongruity hypothesis? 
I let me explain that what that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is that the whole of the question or is there? Yes, is, that's the whole of the question. Are there gradations? Are there gradations? Yeah. So what the status incongruity hypothesis says is that uh, because we have these stereotype views of how women and how men should behave, and women are expected to behave in what's called communal ways. So we're expected to be kind and unselfish and warm and gentle and nurturing and uncompetitive and unself-promoting. And men are expected to behave in what are called agentic ways. So they are supposed to be confident and assertive and dominant and competitive and showing leadership and ambitious and that sort of thing. When a woman starts behaving in those sorts of ways, which you have to do in order to win status, it seems incongruous. So if a woman is showing leadership skills and being dominant and being confident and being assertive, we will tend to recoil from her and we will start to use words like, yes, strident. She'll be strident, she'll be abrasive, she'll be bossy, she'll be domineering, she'll be overbearing, she might even be bitchy or ball breaking. And that's because we find it so incongruous seeing a woman in this senior leadership position. And it just doesn't fit with our stereotypes. And I compare it with, you know, I expect my grandparents recoiled when they saw a woman driving a car. They thought, God, women don't drive cars. That's really, weird. that's really incongruous. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. Or indeed, even my parents' generation, seeing a, 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 a woman dressed formally in trousers was pretty unusual. And now we don't think twice about seeing a woman driving a car or wearing, wearing trousers. So my hope is that eventually, once there are enough women in authority, it will seem so much less incongruous and we'll be able to act in the sort of way that leaders have to act without people feeling uncomfortable. Are there gradations in it? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that question means. Um, I suppose there are in the sense that if we see women in male stereotype as leaders in male stereotype professions, we find it more incongruous. So, you know, a very senior female engineer or a general in the army um, or uh, perhaps a quantum physicist, we would find more incongruous than, you know, the leader of an NHS trust, for instance. Yeah, yes, no, that's a, that's a very interesting Yes, point. So, I mean, essentially, it's just going to take a long time um, to, for these changes to to um, um, come sort of be accepted, really, um, however much, however rational they are. It's going to take a long time for, for, for men, but also for women to see see the equality there and not notice any difference. Um, yeah. Fanny uh, says, I'm glad that doesn't fit with our stereotypes. I don't believe either men or women should behave that way. There's such a thing as soft power, in my opinion. Um, does that does that ring true with you, Marianne? Uh, it depends what world we're living in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you know, if you are in an organization that is predominantly female, you can lead it in a very female way and it will work really well. If you're in a, an organization which is predominantly male, you're not gonna get so far with your soft power, unfortunately, because they won't, you know, they, they're used to a very hier hierarchical, competitive way of dealing with each other. You know, you even see boys being like that. Boys are much more competitive and hierarchical than girls are. Um, and so if, if girls don't, or women don't play that game, then they're not gonna be taken seriously by men, unfortunately. But I mean, a, a more nuanced way of looking at it is different styles of leadership. So management experts say that what they call transformational leadership is the most effective form of leadership. I'm sure lots of you here are, are, are um, aware of that. Um, and that means being um, more democratic as a leader, engaging your employees, inspiring your employees, um, 360 degree feedback, all that sort of thing. That's transformational leadership. Um, and women on average make better transformational leaders. Sorry, they are, are more likely to be good at transformational leadership than men are on average. But actually when you see a really good male leader, he tends to use that sort of technique. Whereas a sort of very top down directive hierarchical leadership is less effective and that tends to be more male. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, um, Chrisita, um, would you like to? Um, you've just put a, an interesting question in the um, in the comments. Would you like to unmute yourself and um, ask Marianne directly?
I'm not sure you're getting that. Um, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll read out what you said. You said, cannot government stroke laws change this quicker? For example, say that if the UK is 50% men and women, then the government has to be 50-50. I mean, yes, that, that makes perfect sense to me as well. Why can't we just say, you know, um, there has to be 50-50 representation of MPs? Is that, is that ever going to happen, do you think? Well, some countries have done it. Rwanda did it, for instance. And in Spain, the government decided they were going to have 50-50 in their cabinet. And so the Labour Party now actually is 50-50 male, female uh, in, in Parliament. So it can be done. Um, whether the government should pass a law, I don't know. I think it would be great, personally. And in fact, the, the main problem is the electoral system we've got. Because um, if you had proportional representation and you've got more than one candidate in each seat, then you could say you've got to have equal numbers of men and women on your candidates list. And in fact, in a lot of countries, they do do that. But because in, with first past the post, you only put up one candidate in each seat, you can't say that candidate's got to be half male, half female. No, 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 <laughs> quite interesting. Um, um, Daniela says power is power. Should we really be talking about it as soft or hard? Doesn't this reinforce a power hierarchy? Mm. Uh, I suppose it depends whether you think soft is better than hard or hard is better than soft. Yeah, yeah. In terms of hierarchy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, true. Um, I'm going to ask um, uh, Lynn Roseman, who is the author of a great book called Now You're Talking. Lynn, you had a question you wanted to ask. Um, I'm hoping you're here. I'm just looking for you. Yes, I can see her. Yes. Okay, yes, yes. Um, that you wanted to ask Marianne. Do you want to unmute yourself and um, and uh, talk? Hello, Marianne. Hi. Thank you for your book. I loved it. I loved it from page one to the very last word. Oh, thank you for putting it <laughs> up on LinkedIn. It. I've been raving all over the place about it. Um, so thank you. Um, it reminded me of a number of speeches I've given to like toast to the lassies at Burns Nights and, and, and set up women are better than men. And then one year I did women are better than men, that men have something to contribute. And actually together, which is I think where you end up, together we are more powerful, we are more effective because we do complement each other, which is it feels like the right place to be. Um, but my question, um, I'm a market researcher turned public speaking coach. And women are notoriously underrepresented as speakers at conferences, keynotes, even on panels. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering what your top advice would be to speakers and to event organizers to try and get something that's got more balance. Well, uh, there was an interesting academic study showing that when uh, women are chairs of conferences, many more women get invited to speak than when men are chairs of conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, at e and even when you control for um, seniority and numbers of women in an academic field, women are less likely to be asked to speak, which is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it was certainly if it's men running the conference, but not if it's women running the conference. So what that shows is that there are enough good women. Uh, I mean, obviously it depends on the subject matter, um, and maybe in you know military history, there are going to be fewer women than uh, you know than a, a conference on nursing or something. But nonetheless, there are generally enough female experts, and you just have to go out and look for them, and also persuade them to um, to come and talk. And it may be that it's harder for them if they've got childcare responsibilities, yeah. so make it easier for them, for instance. Um, but the, 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 this is related, but not exactly the same. You're talking about conferences. Um, there's a very good science writer at the Atlantic called Ed Yong, I think. Yong, yeah. Anyway, he, um, out of interest one year, he decided to count how many female and male scientists he had quoted in his stories in that year. And to his horror, because he thought he was very egalitarian, men outnumbered women by two or three to one. And so as a New Year's resolution, he decided in the following year, he would have exactly 50-50 male and female scientists quoted in his articles. And he said it took him only about 15 more minutes per piece to achieve that. It was actually very easy to do. But instead of just, instead of just sort of going to the top Google hits, um, 
who of course were male scientists who had been chosen by other male journalists. And that's why they're at the top of the Google search results. Instead of just going to the top Google hits, he just did a tiny bit more research and found really interesting female experts to talk to him. And I'm sure he could do exactly the same with conferences. Brilliant. But you have to count. The important thing is to be aware of it and then to keep track of it and make sure you're doing it. Because you often think you're doing very well. And when you actually count, you realize that women are still only 35%, say two men for every woman. No, I think that's right. Thank you. That's great. Um, Celia, um, Celia Rizzo Thanasi, would you like to ask the question you've just put in the chat to, um, to uh, Marianne? Would you like to unmute and ask it? I see Verity's got her hand up too. Oh, Verity, so, sorry. Okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Marianne. Let's go. Let's let's go next, uh, but... Verity, go next, please. Oh, Celia's got camera issues, so maybe oh. Verity you now. Right, Verity. I, yes, I, I just finished the book earlier this evening, and I re really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, and you know, you quite rightly point out the areas where there have been progress, um, the situation in Scandinavian countries, and but you also draw attention to the way that this sort of misogynistic grooming of of boys is impacting girls in schools and it occurred to me and this is particularly in the context of meetings particularly in the political sphere is that i mean do you think there's a sense in which the current sort of disregard for truth sort of in the highest echelons of politics has disadvantaged women because women are much less prepared to just kind of leather and say anything in fact yeah. they will hold back and only say something that they know not only to be true but to be original yeah i think that's a very good point um men are much more likely to bullshit than women and this is again not just anecdotal <laughs> there was a fantastic study of teenagers male and female teenagers in lots of different countries and it was ostensibly to ask them uh, which mathematical concepts they understood and felt comfortable using. But the researchers sneakily put in four concepts that were completely made up. <laughs> and the teenage boys in every country were much more likely to say, oh, yes, I understand that concept and I'm comfortable <laughs> using it, even though it didn't even exist. Much more likely to do that than the girls were. Um, yes. Yeah, so and, and the trouble is that politics these days seems to put a value on bullshit, doesn't it? Much more mm. than it used to. And, and that definitely... That, that definitely advantages men, but it disadvantages the country because we don't want to be run by bullshitters. There's a there's a fantastic book called Why Do So Many Incompetent Men Become Leaders and What Can We Do About It? <laughs> by a brilliant organizational psychologist called Thomas Tramoro Premuzic. Um, I expect some of you have read it. Yeah, um, it's a great book. And it is completely brilliant. And he says, you know, where we go wrong is that we mistake confidence for competence. And, and I've got a whole chapter on this in my book as well. And confidence is not the same as competence, but if you're only going to hire or vote for men who are all sort of puffed up and confident and blustering, then you're gonna end up with incompetent managers and leaders. And he says the very, the very characteristics that get these men to the top in the first place are the very characteristics that make them bad leaders because they overestimate their ability. They're less likely to listen to other people. They're less likely to be humble and modest, which is actually what you want in a leader. And they're less likely to be honest. So he says he's a sexist, but he's a sexist in favor of women because he thinks that women actually make, well, he says the data shows women make better leaders than men. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, I'll um, I'll ask Celia's question um, as she has the problem. Um, what has been the impact of the pen pandemic on the authority gap? Any data on this? I do. I think it's too soon to have data. Um, I mean, we know that women have taken on the vast proportion of unpaid work as well as paid, and homeschooling I think has been disastrous for women in general. Uh, but I think the ability to work flexibly may really help women, well, parents in general. I prefer to say parents than mothers, because I hope that fathers will also take advantage of it. But I mean, you know, mothers have been campaigning for family friendly working for God. I started doing it in the 1990s and it's taken a pandemic to show employers that actually you can be just as productive and just as effective working your hours and wherever you want to work. Um, my only worry is that 
once we do start going back to the office, men are more likely to go back than women and they'll be there schmoozing their superiors and 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 just sort of playing the office politics in a way that perhaps mothers are going to do less and then the mothers will be overlooked for promotion in favor of the of the guys yeah mm. um krista says i usually see a three to one ratio on tv programs men to women very rarely 50 50 or more women than men. I was reminded of um, of your your story about well, not really a story, but research about the character of Dana Scully um, in the X Files. Um, just just tell us about that and whether you think that uh, TV and popular culture has um, the power to make changes too. Oh, it is so powerful. This was the most extraordinary study, which talked to women of a certain generation in STEM fields. And the reason they had to be of that generation was because they had to be of the right age to have watched the X-Files when they were children. And Scully was this fantastic female scientist character in the X-Files. And 63% of those women said they'd, inspired, they'd been inspired to go into these STEM fields by Scully. So if one female character in one TV show can change that many people's lives, I find that completely extraordinary. But it made me realize just how important the media are for either perpetuating these stereotypes or indeed starting to overcome them. And I think the number of female scientists that we have seen on screen during the pandemic, I think will make an enormous difference to the next generation growing up, both boys and girls thinking that women can be scientists too. There's a, a study that's been going on for a long time asking children to draw a scientist. And back in the 60s and 70s, there was something like 98% men you know, they always drew a man as a scientist. Now it's down to early 70s, but that's because not because boys are drawing female scientists, but at least more girls now are. So that's good. But actually, um, was it Celia's observation about three to one or maybe it was someone um, else? Anyway, Christa's, I think. Yes. Yeah, it's Christa. Hi, Christa. Um, actually, that is changing. And that's something that really cheered me up. So the BBC started something a few years ago called the 5050 Equality Project and got individual programmes to sign up to it. And what they have to do is to make sure that everybody, sorry, that the, 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 um, the people on screen are 50% men and 50% women, whether they are invited experts and guests or whether they're presenters or whatever. And they are only allowed to deviate from this rule if it's someone who uh, they have to have, like the prime minister only happens to be a man or whatever, or an eyewitness, the only eyewitness was a man. And it has really changed our TV and it's very, very recent. So I'm sure the three to one ratio was probably true about five or 10 years ago, but it's now getting much more equal, which I think is fantastic. And it's not just the BBC doing it, other organizations, other broadcasters are signing up for it. And now even the FT now has a bot which analyzes reporters' stories and tells them if they're quoting more men than women. No coincidence, I think that the editor of the FT is now a woman. Um, yeah. but, you know, uh, uh, TV drama is improving slowly, but it is improving. We're getting quite a lot more, you know, whether it's sort of Killing Eve or Fleabag or, um, gosh, of course, I can't remember the names now, Big Little Lies, that sort of thing. There, there are now many more really great shows with interesting women showing agency. They're not just sex objects or help meets. But I think movies are still pretty far behind. In fact, there was a study that came out only yesterday or the day before showing that still about 85% of directors of movies are men and behind the camera, um, you know, most other jobs, cinematographers are about 90% male. And I think women, uh, men get about twice as much speaking time on films on average as women. Still. Yeah, but, and I think they still think that, um, uh, you know, male stars are the box office. They're the ones that are going, are going to draw in the crowds. I, I honestly don't know why they think that. I'm much more likely <laughs> to go and see a film with a good woman in it than yeah, a man, absolutely. but um, that seems to be it. Um, Fanny says they've made the new Barbie doll in the image of the lady who did the work on the COVID vaccine, which is, which yes. is great. Um, Larry Gilbert, so, that's right. Yeah, She's yeah. fantastic. I saw her at a conference. She's one of the most intelligent and authoritative women I've ever seen. She was extraordinary. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. Yes. Oh, there's, um, there's a good point that Kerry makes. Unfortunately, the victims in murder mysteries are usually young girls oh, or women. That get is me very true. So true. And, you know, why do, why do I want to watch it? My brother used to ask me when I was young, you know, why don't you want to watch these thrillers? 
And I said, because it's always a young woman being stalked and killed by a man. Why would that appeal to me? Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marianne, I'm really interested to know wh- which of the <laughs> which of the um, personal sort of slights that you've received over the years as a woman for being a woman, which are the ones that really stick with you and that you, you know, you still remember and still sting? OK, so I was at a, a conference and it was one it was quite a small one, only about 80 people. And we'd we'd each been up on stage at some point during the course of the day and sort of seen each other in action and got each other's measure. And I was sat next to a man at dinner whom I hadn't interacted with during the course of the day. So he asked me what I did. And as, I, as you said, I lead a portfolio life and I didn't know which of the things I was currently doing would most interest him. So I said, well, you know, I write a column in The Independent, I'm on the Council of Tate Modern, sit on a couple of boards, chair a think tank. And he said, wow, you're a busy little girl. <laughs> I was older than the then prime minister. Unbelievable. <laughs> God, it's just... I, so, uh... I mean, it's annoying enough being called a girl, isn't it? Yes, Except in yes. by your girlfriends. A little girl. I said, do you know what? I didn't think I'd been called a little girl since I was about six. And I remember it really annoying me even then. Yeah, incredible. Yes. And obviously that still kind of that still rankles um, as it should. Indeed. What did you uh, what, what do you think is the best way to respond when that kind of thing happens? Do you think you should call it out? Do you I mean, I know it depends on the situation and all oh, that, yeah. but, you know, should it should we always call it out? I think we should. I mean, we should ideally call it out with humour, though I don't see why we should, frankly, but but it would probably land better if we call it out with humour. I, 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 I told the story on Twitter and asked what I should have done. And most people said either you should have stabbed him with your fork or poured your glass of wine over his head. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. have the nerve to do that. I did call it out. But then the trouble is, if you turn it round, he said, oh, well, I wouldn't have minded being called a little boy. Yeah. And the trouble yeah. is, it's not symmetrical, is it? No, I mean, A, no. No, one, no one would call him a little boy. And B, it's where if you are if you are basically the oppressed group it matters a lot more doesn't it yes yes of course and that as you say there's that whole invisibility thing men just don't don't see the 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 privilege that they have it's just it's just vanilla to them it's it's the status quo yeah I think in general it's 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 best if you can recruit allies to call these things out because as you said earlier if you do it yourself you're like liable to be labeled as difficult or prickly or paranoid or oversensitive whatever but you know if if suppose i'm being interrupted in a meeting and you say oh hang on a minute i really wanted to hear what marianne was saying there that's helpful or if you're chairing the meeting or if i make a point no one takes any notice a man makes exactly the same point 10 minutes later and he's sort of wildly applauded for it. You can say, oh, I'm so glad you agree with what Marianne said earlier. That's yeah. very helpful. Do you think you need to prime people to do that in advance? And does it matter if the allies are uh, male or female? Do you get more, well, more tragic- traction from a male ally? Tragically, it probably helps if they are male, because that, that's the phenomenon I'm writing about, is that men are taken more seriously, particularly by other men. Um, if you prime them, obviously, they're more likely to do it. But I think if they don't instinctively do it, you can say to them after the meeting, gosh, did you notice what happened there? It'd be really helpful if next time you spot that happening, you could just you know, come in on my behalf. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we really need to we really need to build up those allies or potential allies who are out there and prime people before meetings or before particular events that are likely to, um, you know, have have those sorts of issues. Um, Satna says, Actually, oh, sorry, sorry just she says same with that with white allies for the BAME community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very yeah. much. And I write a bit about that in the book as well, or quite a lot, in fact. Yes. Um, but, I, but I think also, I think women need to be better allies to other women. And I've got a whole chapter about how actually women are also biased against women in the same way. Uh, less so, but we still are. And, uh, and actually, the research shows that men on the whole are better at affirming each other than women are. And you see this right back in childhood, you know, a popular boy in the class will have his sort of henchmen will laugh at all his jokes and sort of big him up and we women aren't so good at doing that to each other and I think it would be helpful if we did yeah yeah um yes and and Satmar also says all straight ones for the LGBTQ plus community and yes women supporting women absolutely um 
Ellis, yes, interestingly, yes, Krista says, have contracts for the meeting for expected behaviours, but usually meetings don't have any contracts. So yes, you could could have, yes, in within your own business or company or team, you could have contracts for meetings. That's an interesting idea. I just think the chair really needs to be very alert to this sort of yeah. thing. And the chair needs to say, no, I won't have interruptions in this meeting. I want everybody to be able to finish what they want to say. And, and, and the chair can set to, you know, pull up short somebody who talks for too much, a man who talks too much and say, actually, I think we've, you know, probably had enough from you because, you know, I'm worried that Lucy hasn't had a chance to make her point yet and draw out um, women who are perhaps, you know, holding back a bit, who are being a bit reticent. Yes, um, Lucy, another Lucy um, here, Lucy Barkas says, we have to stop the mean girls myth that teaches us that women don't support women. It took me a long, it took me years to unlearn that one. So yes, maybe we, yeah. um, we have the wrong um, um, idea there. Um, Marianne, I spend a lot of time <laughs> telling women to write their books and get their books published because I think that a book is a, uh, a kind of a gender neutral, iconic um, way of um, getting authority, of, 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 of creating um, e equality and uh, credibility for women. Do you find, I mean, I, I'm amazed kind of that, that the authority gap is your first book um, after all the writing you've done. But do you find that being the author of a book um, has given you more authority, more credibility? Do people listen more to you because of it? Well, it's slightly hard to say because, it, you know, it came out during a pandemic. So uh, most true. of the stuff <laughs> I do at the moment is on Zoom and it's very hard to tell if they're listening or not. Probably gone off to make a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> Um, but yes, I mean, at least I feel I, what I've done now is I've drilled down into one subject. So I actually genuinely have more expertise and authority on this subject now than I used to when I was a journalist and I was um, flitting about from one subject to another. So I do feel now at last I've researched something in really great depth and that helps. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I've got a whole another chapter on how men are much less, much more reluctant to read books by women than we are to read books by men. Yeah. So even though I've written a book, it still doesn't give me as much authority in the eyes of men as a man writing a book will. So we, on average, we women will read roughly 50-50. It um, was about 55% female authors, 45% male authors, but you know, it's roughly half and half men and women. For men, the ratio is 80-20. So they're four times more likely to read a book by a man than a book by a woman. Yeah. And that in itself, I think, is great evidence of the authority gap. They're not yeah. taking our seriously absolutely yes and that yes it's like uh you know if a man writes a book it's for everybody if a woman writes a book it's just for other women yeah that's yeah to be, i had uh, to fight so hard <laughs> to have a cover design that i thought would appeal as much to men as to women and that didn't look sort of girly or yeah, feminine really, really really did they make did they want to make it pink do you know the very first design that the designer came up with was pink and that my editor didn't even <laughs> dare show it to me because she knew how enraged I would be <laughs> because you're then instantly cutting out half the potential readership. And, and I want men to read this book because the world won't change if only women read it. No, sadly. no, exactly. And I even thought of calling myself M.A. Seacart on the cover rather than Marianne. That, yeah, in, that's in a, very in a, interesting. In a sort of yeah. joke, tongue in cheek way. Yes. But it's making the sort of meta point. Yes, that, yes. Um, but yes, yeah. no, I noticed that all your your social media tags are M.A. C-Cart. And yeah. Um, well, that's actually mainly because if it's hard enough to spell C-Cart, it's even <laughs> harder to get Mary Ann right as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, Sapna says, I actually considered putting my book out under a under a male white name, um, yeah. which is um, which is sort of depressing. But you didn't do it, Sapna, anyway. So um um, that that's good. Um, and you, are, you also... that I, but I do tell the story in the book of um, of a, a, a novelist called Serena Macassey, who couldn't get anywhere because her books were sort of treated like chick lit, even though they weren't. They were dealing with quite serious subjects. But the blurb on the back would always be, you know, can so and so find a boyfriend? And uh, so she reinvented herself as Alex Marwood. So gender neutral first name. And she's never looked back. <laughs> Yeah. And she's won awards and her books have sold by the, you know, not about millions, but incredibly successful. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, in the in the research I did for my book, it's really clear that if you write a manuscript and put the same manuscript in front of agents or publishers with the man's name and with a women, woman's name, you get a far better response from the same manuscript with a man's name on it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. that's right. Absolutely. Even in fiction, which is supposedly yes. dominated by by women writers and yes. read predominantly by women you still do better with a man's name absolutely and, and awards mostly go to men novelists um you know yeah. for, if a man writes a novel about something domestic it's a it's a wonderful metaphor for the state of the world but if a woman That's does right. it's just sort of gossip and chat and kitchen yeah. sink um yeah, yeah. <laughs> depressing <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah no um yes hence hence jk rowling as um satna says mm. um uh, satna says would be funny if your surname started with an n mary then your initials would be man man that would be funny <laughs> <laughs> or indeed with a d and i'd be mad <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. yes indeed um so um uh um what finally um Marianne what tips do you have for all of us what can we all do to start changing the situation a little bit faster than it is now how can we be as women how can we be more authoritative um make people see greater authority in women I think that we need to, even if we're not feeling confident in our views we need to act confident I do think fake it till you make it is quite important and I think if you act more confident people will take you more seriously and then you will feel more confident because people are taking you more seriously so I think don't be apologetic inhabit your you know proportionate conversational space don't um, do up talk at the end of your sentences as if you're not quite sure what you think uh, don't hedge about saying, well, you know, I don't know if I know enough about this, but maybe it's occurred to me that perhaps just say what you think. You know, you deserve your place at the table as much as they do. And if you act as confidently as the men while covering it with a very warm veneer, because that's sadly that we have to do that. Um, so smile a lot and use your emotional intelligence. Um, but nonetheless, be quite clear about what you think then I think you will be taken more seriously. That's brilliant. Thank you so very much, Marianne. This has been a, um, an absolutely fabulous hour. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a, um, a pleasure and an honour to have you here in the Abu Group talking about the authority gap thank you so much for your insights your honesty and your time and can we can we give mariana possibly silent but round of applause <laughs> thank Aww. you so much for your well, time thank you lucy a great questions really engaging group and thank you all for coming you know when you could be i don't know getting drunk in the pub or whatever <laughs> well, yeah. but uh, maybe finally maybe. before we go can I remind anyone here who had a book published in 2021 um, a non-fiction book to submit it to enter it in the business book awards and that includes you Marianne <laughs> please get well it's up to my publisher but yeah, yes thank you. we'll remind them to the entries are now open for the business book awards um, right. entries close on the 31st of January so uh, if you if you can anybody enter your book for them now and uh who knows where what wonderful awards you may win okay thank you very much everyone for being here and thank you again marianne seacart for being an absolutely wonderful um author in the abu book club tonight thank you very much thank you bye bye everyone will you save the chat thread for me lucy please absolutely yep yeah, no, let me stop recording. That would be sensible.